went off on the fire trucks. We had the ABC radio on, so we were listening to constant updates. We just sat there in silence. As soon as I wake up, every night. Congratulations to the ABC once again, day, outstanding reporting both on the TV and the radio. I know that it's you I need to take the blues away. It must be love, love, love. This has only just come through in the last few minutes. It must be love. absolutely vital that you're there and providing the service to our community. It must be love, love, love. It must be love, love, love. November 4. The US election is here. Now we can finally get some closure. Join us on election night for a Planet America special. Can the Democrats defeat Trump? The polls suggest they can. Why does this feel like deja vu? The Planet America election special, November 4 on ABC News. Brock could just get in anything and drive it. He could do no wrong. He was the messiah of motorsport. Behind the wheel, he seemed to be almost bulletproof. Women swooned. Men just wanted to be like him. Peter needed to be respected, needed to be loved. I don't think anyone could control Brock. How the f*** could you do that? The rise and fall and rise and fall and rise and fall of Peter Brock. Tomorrow, it's the antidote to ad nauseum. You don't care what soap you use, but the others will cover you in scum. Making sense of the madness. Dove isn't the only non-soap trying to clean up in 2020. I can think of one link between hands and Vaseline that wasn't in that ad. <laughs> Gruen, tomorrow on ABC and iView. Dear humans, we need to talk. There's pollution in my air and plastic in my oceans. My trees and animals are disappearing and my temperature is rising. My climate is changing. I think I can fix it, but I can't fix it on my own. Small changes can have a big impact. And right now, we need to take care of each other. Signed, Your Planet. A season of stories exploring our environment. Your Planet on ABC. In the final episode... There was no warning. People woke up in the pitch black in waist-height water. Craig faces his fear in raging flood water. Whoa! It's now on the windshield. Why do people go in then? Why do people do it? It's one of the most dangerous things you can do. This is frightening. Big weather, tonight on ABC. Part of your planet. New house rules for Melburnians as Victoria records zero new COVID take cases and no deaths. Low numbers in Victoria and New South Wales reignite the debate over border restrictions. Severe thunderstorms lash southeast Queensland with warnings there's more to come. And coming up on the business, Victorian employers eager to reopen after months of lockdown. Welcome to ABC News. I'm Lorna Dunkley. It is just hours now until many Melbourne businesses can finally reopen and families can reunite after the government announced the rules around home visits. It's been another day of zero cases and zero COVID deaths in Victoria. Those figures have seen Melbourne's 14-day average go down to 2.8. It's now 0.2 in the regions. The Premier says his focus now, though, is working towards Victorians being able to spend Christmas with their loved ones. But he has warned masks are here to stay until next year. Here's Elias Kluwer. The dark opening is well underway. Bring it on. We're, we're ready to go. As venues prepare for socially starved Melburnians, a lot of work to do in 24 hours, short notice, a um, lot to get done, but I put all my staff on today to get everything prepped up. Good afternoon, Prince Alfred, Mike speaking. Phones are ringing off the hook at the city's pubs and restaurants. I think this week in particular will be, will be non-stop. The whole of Melbourne's just itching to get out. Signs of life are again emerging on Melbourne's high streets, where retailers are preparing to open their doors getting confirmation that we can actually 
uh, open and, and start trading, especially coming into the busiest time of the year, being the Christmas trade period, uh, is relief. The reopening comes off the back of more good news. Another day of zero, the first time Victoria's seen two days in a row with no new cases since the 5th and 6th of March. Double donut day is, uh, is terrific. Um, but as I say, it's a milestone. Uh, it's not the end. But it is the end of a total ban on home visits. From midnight tonight, two adults and their dependents can visit one other Melbourne household. But it's only one visit a day with no time limit. So after that, the visitors and the people living in the house cannot see any other Melburnians unless it's outdoors. It'll mean a Kual Ding's newborn daughter will be able to meet her extended family for the first time. And I'm looking forward for my nieces and because they're very excited to meet their little cousin and uh, yeah, I just... The thought of it is really like bringing me joy. But it's been a long few months disconnected from the people she loves. Didn't have the family support and my friends coming around and helping out like physically was a bit challenging. There's some semblance of normality returning to a city that's been effectively locked down for 110 days. On Saturday, kids will be allowed to trick or treat for Halloween, even though it may involve more hand sanitizer than sweets. And perhaps scarily for some, the Premier says the masks will stay on until the end of the year and possibly into next year. I know it's frustrating. I know that no one particularly enjoys wearing a mask. The Premier says it's a small price to pay for a priceless reward. Elias Kluwer, ABC News, Melbourne. Meantime, the New South Wales Premier has made it clear she won't be rushed into opening the border to Victoria now that restrictions are easing in the southern state. But Gladys Berejiklian is continuing to take a swipe at the Queensland Premier over her decision to keep the northern border shut, describing it as completely unnecessary. Here's state political reporter Ashley Raper. The Premier is back in familiar terrain. So cute talking policies, the pandemic and the politics of border closures. The residents of New South Wales would expect me and my government to be responsible in how we deal with that. So we'll take the border down as soon as we can. But just how soon the Victorian border will open is unclear. What is really important to us is to see what happens once Victorians, once the government eases restrictions down there. That's the real test. It's not a startling comment in any way. I think we're all going to look very closely at how things go in the next few weeks. Both governments acknowledge any decision must be informed by the data. Are they comfortable that we're giving them everything possible so that they've got a real sense of what's going on? Um, and then I think as soon as we can get it open and we can be agreed on that, we will. While there's agreement to the south, there's still animosity to the north. She knows my position <laughs> very strongly. I just wish we'd take the, the games out of this because it's affecting people's lives. Gladys Berejiklian continues to disagree with Anastasia Palaszczuk's decision to keep the Queensland border shut. And five days out from the Queensland election, she has support from an unlikely source. Let's move forward. And the way to move forward is to open up the borders. We have to do this as a country, not have state borders. I will concede that I will listen to the health advice to keep Queenslanders safe every single day. That is my job. The Queensland Premier did hint, though, that an announcement on the border is imminent. Tasmania has decided to open its border to New South Wales from next Friday. There have been two new cases of coronavirus in New South Wales, both are linked to the Oran Park cluster, while 10 are in hotel quarantine. The issue of the Victorian border will be tricky to negotiate for Gladys Berejiklian. She risks being accused of double standards after the very public stoush with Queensland and its border. But there are genuine concerns within senior levels of the New South Wales government about opening up to Victoria, and that's likely to delay a decision. Ashley Raper, ABC News, Sydney. Well, Scott Morrison's using the easing of restrictions in Victoria to urge all states and territories to guard against further lockdowns. The Prime Minister says every jurisdiction needs to ensure its testing, tracing and quarantine systems are up to scratch. As the Reserve Bank hints, the economic, the economic recovery is already underway. Political editor Andrew Probin has more. All eyes have anxiously been on Victoria for months. There will be scars that will be carried by Victorians. Victorians have indeed paid a price. 
federal parliament commending those in the southern state for their patience and sacrifice. But with Melbourne and its surrounds to emerge from one of the world's longest lockdowns, passions roar. The pain, the cost, the loss of Victorian people. It should have never, ever have come to this. The Treasurer, a Victorian, worried of the damage already wrought. My children are like the children of everyone else from Victoria in this place. Six months lost from schooling, Mr Speaker. Six months that they will never, ever get back. Josh Frydenberg didn't name the Victorian Premier, but the criticism was implicit. Dan Andrews' Labor colleagues on the defensive. Yeah, there have been mistakes, but the Victorian government has also been a source of crystal clear decisions. Once restrictions in Victoria ease from midnight, the Prime Minister's urging no return to shutdown. As we look to the future, we cannot look to a future of lockdowns as a way of managing this virus. Health crisis in check, the economic challenge remains. The Reserve Bank saying the September quarter's likely to show Australia's growing again, ending technical recession. Growth elsewhere in the country was more than the drag from Victoria and possibly the drag from Victoria was a little less than what we guessed back in August. Australia might just be winning the health battle against the coronavirus. Few countries can boast that. But securing economic recovery requires domestic borders to be lifted, even if the international border remains closed. Every state, including those shut off, needs to learn to live alongside the virus until a vaccine's found. Andrew Proben, ABC News, Canberra. The Defence Force has admitted the door on its multi-role Taipan helicopters is too narrow to allow its gun to fire while troops are descending from the aircraft. A third round of modifications being carried out on the European-designed aircraft, which was purchased for nearly $4 billion. It's an issue of the width of the door. Um, the door is, uh, isn't wide enough to enable the safe exit whilst firing is taking place. The issue is actually the door. Yes. The Army says it sometimes has to fly the MRH-90 in pairs to complete certain missions. For the second time in three days, Queensland's southeast's been hit by supercells dumping huge hail and heavy rain. Drivers caught out by flash flooding at Newstead have had to climb on top of their cars to get to safety. Homes have been flooded and more than 5,000 homes are without power. Queenslanders are being warned to prepare for a second wave tomorrow. Lexi Hamilton-Smith reports. It came hard and fast, inundating some houses. At Highgate Hill, the basement of this home flooded, the water gushing in from the back of the property. Floodwaters rose so quickly at East Brisbane, drivers were forced to climb onto roofs and wait for help. At the Gabba, roads awash with water also proved a hazard for motorists. Notorious low spots making the peak hour commute difficult many roads remain blocked. I've come into the city today to do some training and I finish and walk back to see my car being flooded. Well, we've never seen this park like a lake before. Yeah, it's so bad. Kedron Brook swollen and people are being told to stay away as levels rise. Near Warwick, this unusual cold air funnel of cloud was an ominous sign. As storm cells smash large parts of the southeast, a 600 kilometre stretch in the potential danger zone. Hail the size of tennis balls hit some regions blanketing the ground. The icy rocks cracking this driver's windscreen inland of Noosa. The superstorm also brought heavy rain. Near Gladstone, the owners of this property got their biggest single fall in two years, around 60 millimetres. Parch farmland near Kilcoy is now sodden. Just to show how much water we just got. Insane. As our properties north of Gympie, it's a welcome sight. I was trying to see where the water's running into my dam. Can't see a damn thing, <laughs> except a lot of bloody water on the ground. Residents west of Bow Desert reported around 100 millimetres of rain in an hour as suburban water tanks fill up. Tonight there is a chance that severe storms could continue. With a dangerous second wave forecast tomorrow. There'll be a renewed pulse of upper atmospheric support which will cause storms to become reinvigorated. 
The storm season's well and truly here, bringing a little joy to some. Lexi Hamilton-Smith, ABC News. There are fears that hundreds of asylum seekers living in community detention could soon be homeless. The federal government has decided to remove their housing and income support by shifting them onto new visas. Advocates are worried that finding work and stable housing will be much harder for them because of the pandemic. Local communities reporter Lydia Feng has the story. Rana and her family are preparing to leave their home in Western Sydney, but it's not by choice. The Iranian asylum seekers recently received a letter from the Home Affairs Department saying they're being moved out of community detention and onto temporary bridging visas. It means they'll lose their housing and income support. It was a real shock for us when we received the letter. They're now scrambling to find jobs, but after years of being denied the right to work, it's proving difficult, especially during the pandemic. If office workers are losing their jobs, how are we supposed to find a job? Rana and her family are some of the 270 asylum seekers who were transferred from Nauru and Papua New Guinea to Australia for medical reasons. They've now been issued final departure visas, giving them six months to leave the country. Advocates say the visas leave them vulnerable and with little government support. What we would really need to say is um, releasing people into the community but with support um, rather than releasing them with 21 days notice to find housing, find a job to support themselves and their families. Charities fear they'll be overwhelmed by requests for assistance. And it's really not sustainable in the longer term that the federal government changes responsibility that is them, their responsibility into the charity sector. With no job prospects and little in the way of savings, those affected are urging the government to show compassion and provide financial support to help them stay afloat during the pandemic. In response, the Home Affairs Department said their new visas grant them work rights and access to Medicare while they finalise their arrangements to leave the country. For now, Rana and her family are relying on the generosity of friends and charities to survive one day at a time. Lydia Feng, ABC News, Sydney. A man who fatally stabbed a woman during a rampage through Sydney's CBD last year has pleaded guilty. The shocking circumstances of Michaela Dunn's death were revealed today in court. Her killer, Mert Ney, sent videos and Facebook messages from the murder scene bragging about his crime. And a warning, some viewers may find details in this story distressing. It's been more than a year since the heart of Sydney was thrown into lockdown during Mert Ney's violent spree. Get away for the cops, wait for the cops. Paul, give me your phone, mate. When he was subdued by bystanders, he'd already fatally stabbed 24-year-old Michaela Dunn and badly injured a bypasser, Lynn Bowe. After months of delays and adjournments, today he pleaded guilty to three charges, including murder. He's accepted responsibility for what he has done. Court documents reveal Ney inflicted extensive and fatal injuries on Ms Dunn after arriving at an apartment for an appointment to have sex. At the bloody scene, he filmed a short selfie video in which he yelled Allah Akbar before turning the camera to her body. Then he forwarded that video to a friend. Yeah, I'm a psycho, he wrote. I was laughing, bro. Call cops. Ney left a trail of blood down the stairs of the building before he ran through the city streets. He is very sorry for what he has done. After his arrest, Ney told police he didn't remember killing anyone. I only remember popping pills and then my legs are all cut up. He presented himself at Blacktown Hospital days before the incident, but checked out after six hours. When the case returns to court in December for sentencing proceedings, remorse will be a key issue. And also his mental health conditions, which was a significant contributing factor to what occurred. Another step towards justice in a long road for Michaela's family. Jamie McKinnell, ABC News, Sydney. Two rival crime families and their friends are at the centre of a massive police crackdown after a spate of shootings across Sydney. 22 people have been banned from certain suburbs following the execution of the younger brother of a notorious gangland figure. But the orders are about to expire and police are now scrambling for a permanent solution. Crime reporter Mark Reddy reports. It's a tale of two underworld families, and the last thing police want is a sequel, executing raids on homes across Sydney's southwest. 
show. Close air. We are having people dying in the street. We are sick of it. A 25-year-old man was arrested and illegal pistols seized, but it's not the breakthrough police crave. Majid Hamzi, the brother of notorious gang leader Basam Hamzi, was shot dead outside his Condal Park home a week ago. Two men are still on the run, but before that murder, there was this, a brawl between the Hamzi and Alamedine families. And police fear it could be part of a new gangland war. I'm sure the community are sick of these crime groups using our streets and our homes as shooting ranges. Over the weekend, 22 people from both gangs were prevented from moving across the city. The Alamedines and their associates were banned from going anywhere near Condal Park and other nearby suburbs, including Bankstown and Silverwater. They were also banned from Bronte and Clavelli in the city's east and parts of the city's south. The Humsies and their associates were banned from parts of Western Sydney, including Blacktown, Mount Druitt and Parramatta. The orders only lasted 72 hours and have since expired, so police will have to go through the courts to apply for new orders that could impose restrictions on those 22 people for up to five years. It's a rare move, but one police hope will save lives. It will prevent them associating with other criminals, it will prevent them utilising weapons of crime will prevent them having encrypted communications. A crackdown that's hoped will ultimately achieve a ceasefire. Mark Reddy, ABC News, Sydney. Six people have been sentenced for their roles in the death of a Queensland woman who was beaten and stabbed west of Brisbane in 2018. The Toowoomba Supreme Court was told the confrontation was sparked by a feud between families and a warning. This story contains the name and image of an Indigenous person who has died. Debbie Kambango was at home with her pregnant daughter in 2018 when a group of people she knew stormed a Wilsonton unit in Toowoomba. The pair was beaten with weapons including a golf club, a hammer and a metal pole. Miss Kambango suffered a 23 centimetre stab wound to the chest and died from her injuries. Six of the group pleaded guilty to manslaughter while three others are yet to stand trial charged with murder. Today in the Supreme Court in Toowoomba, Ashley Fing, Lynn Anderson and Yana Hall were sentenced to five years jail, suspended after time already served and placed on probation. Tai Fing was sentenced to five years jail, Joshua Ling Woodock six years and Christine Hall six and a half. The three are now eligible for parole. In sentencing, Justice Peter Callahan said he accepted none of the six caused injuries that led to Miss Kambango's death. Indeed, you were not even in the same room as the deceased when the fatal injuries were caused. The court heard the confrontation was sparked by a rift between families after a relative of some of the defendants died from a drug overdose. Justice Callahan said he hoped the incident did not lead to an ongoing feud. The situation is complicated. It is plain to me, however, that Debbie was much loved. The three charged with murder are due to stand trial early next year. Ashley Stevenson, ABC News. The Republican-controlled Senate has helped reshape the US judiciary by confirming the fast-tracked appointment of Supreme Court nominee Amy Coney Barrett. The Conservative Justice replaces Democrat appointee Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who died last month. Barrett's confirmation could potentially sway rulings on abortion, health care and indeed the election result itself. The president celebrated at the White House after a long day on the campaign trail in Pennsylvania, from where North America correspondent Catherine Diss reports. From the in Allentown, Pennsylvania, there was nothing but love for the president. For the last four years, you have seen me fight for you. On November 3rd, we must finish the job and drain the swamp once and for all. Deep in blue-collar country, he played to his working-class crowd. But we won't talk about that in front of the fake news. Well, as he's been president, the economy's been great. My husband has been able to work and support me and my four sons. My life has improved in the last four years. I feel like everyone's has with the tax cuts. It's been great for the economy and he helps every party like women and minorities. The tax cuts helped me out big time because, you know, I don't really have the most secure job at the moment. 
Donald Trump and his fans know Pennsylvania charts an almost sure path to victory. He's blitzing three counties here in just a number of hours. This one, Hillary Clinton won four years ago. He's hoping he's expanded his base enough to flip it. Get your friends, get your family, get your neighbours and get your co-workers and get the hell out to vote, please. In true Trump style, he capitalised on what appeared to be a gaffe by his rival, Joe Biden. Four more years of George, uh, George, uh, he uh, is going to find ourselves in a position where if uh, Trump gets elected, uh, we're going to be uh, we're going to be in a different world. What a mess. Now, he called me George. I don't know if I should be insulted or happy about it. It's sort of insulted. That's the first time that's happened to me. You know, Joe, there's going to be eight days left. Biden's team say he was referring to the web events host, comedian George Lopez. Today, Joe Biden was campaigning in the same battleground state. The bottom line is Donald Trump is the worst possible president, the worst possible person to try to lead us through this pandemic. And I don't think he just either doesn't have any idea what to do or he just doesn't care. Just eight days before the election, Democrats were unable to stop the confirmation of conservative Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court. The Republican Senate majority decided to thwart the will of the people and confirm a lifetime appointment to the Supreme Court in the middle of a presidential election after more than 60 million Americans have voted. Tonight's White House celebration was a more cautious affair than Amy Coney Barrett's nomination, which was dubbed a COVID-19 super spreader event. The President of the United States and Justice Amy Coney Barrett she is the Trump administration's third conservative appointment, shifting the nation's highest court further to the right. It's a privilege to be asked to serve my country in this office, and I stand here tonight truly honoured and humbled. Even if the president loses next week's election, he will leave a legacy that could last a generation. Catherine Dis, ABC News, Pennsylvania. Hundreds of protesters have taken to the streets of a number of Italian cities to protest against new coronavirus restrictions. Violence flared in some centres over the new rules which force restaurants and cafes to close early and sees the closure of cinemas and gyms. In France, a doctor advising the government says the country has lost control of the epidemic after the largest one-day increase in cases since April. Both France and Spain have confirmed more than 50,000 new cases in the last 24 hours. Japan's Prime Minister has promised to fundamentally shift the country's coal policy to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. The target will bring Japan in line with the aims of the European Union, which set the same goal last year. It's a major change in climate ambition for the world's third largest economy and will have a major impact here in Australia. Professor Daniel Nyberg from the University of Newcastle Business School says it's a great change for Japan. They are basically com almost completely dependent on fossil fuel at the moment. I think around 75% of their energy is based on either coal or gas. I mentioned that it will have an impact here in Australia. How? Well, it's two basic ways. The first one is uh, the most important, I think, for the Australian coal and gas industry is that this is our biggest export country. So uh, Japan... Uh, import $20 billion worth of uh, coal and a similar amount of gas every year. So this is huge for Australia that Japan has joined China and South, South Korea, the three biggest importers of our gas and coal uh, for carbon neutrality. Secondly, it means that Australia is really lagging behind now. Uh, we have no bias for the coal and gas that we've been uh, spruiking for some time. Oh, OK, and we'll talk about Australia's targets or, or lack of, um, as some people see it, in a moment. But how can Australia then prepare for what is ahead over the next three decades? I think Australia need to join the rest of the world in uh, transmitting to low-carbon energy. 
So instead of a gas-led recovery, we can start thinking about our renewable recovery, where we slightly so ever over the next decade or so shift our energy mix towards renewable and do that through investments uh, rather than only private initiatives. That's not bringing money into Australia, though, is it? Or can we be exporting some of those renewables? Well, Australia was absolute world leading in renewable energies. And I, I see no reason why we can't be that again, considering our place on, on the planet and, the, and, and our technologies we have had. The, the, the Japanese Prime Minister said in making this announcement that he wants um, it to work for the Japanese economy because there's long been scepticism that uh, going green, being, if you can say it as basically as that, is not good for economies. How, how does he see it then that it can work for the economy? No, I think that's a key message to take out of this, that this is really a policy towards economic growth. He sees that this is a way to grow the economy by reinvesting in uh, other technologies. So he talked about uh, advanced technologies around carbon recycling. He talked about uh, solar battery in his ministry has done. So there is a clear shift in investments and then hoping, obviously, that this is going to be technologies that could sell to the rest of the world. He's also talking about nuclear, isn't he? Something that's uh, not on discussion here. Yes, of course. And I think there is something hiding here in terms of not learning the lesson from uh, Fukushima in 2011. I think there is probably discussing how to, we can they can make nuclear slightly more safe. Uh, but we know the, the dangers with that, of course. Two new scientific papers have confirmed there is water on the moon and some of it in places that weren't expected. The discovery will be a boost for future missions as the vital resource could provide both sustenance and fuel to crews. National science reporter Michael Slezak has the story. It's the most sought after commodity in the solar system. Water is a space currency. It's the most valuable thing anywhere. Now NASA has discovered there's more of it on the moon than we thought. This research shows that actually there's a lot of water and, you know, there's a mechanism by which it gets produced. So that's the most important thing, that we have a resource that is renewable to some extent. Before now, scientists knew water was there, but mostly as ice in deep, dark craters near the poles. The new water is easier to reach. We see our role as potentially being able to mine, help mine the moon for these valuable resources. All of that means crewed missions to the moon and beyond could become a whole lot easier. Uh, you can make oxygen from water to breathe, you can make fuel from water, right? To become proper planetary, interplanetary species, we need space deposit of water. To find the new water, the scientists used a jumbo jet called SOFIA, kitted out with a special telescope. They've taken the side off that jet and they've taken this aircraft up 12 kilometres above our own atmosphere to peer at the moon. Another team found the moon had 40,000 square kilometres of shadows that could trap ice in easy-to-reach places. But even that isn't a lot. It's much drier than the driest desert on the Earth. But as nations eye off locations for bases on the moon and corporations search for commodities, it could be enough to avoid conflict. There is a lot of area to cover and therefore we don't have to sort of fight around it, which is good news. Good news with crewed missions to the moon planned for as soon as 2024. Michael Slezak, ABC News.